Welcome to my channel, The Binge Eating Therapist. I'm Sarah, former binge eater turned psychotherapist, and my mission is to use this space to bring content to you to help you understand your struggle with food and break free from binge eating. And since my last video, which was an interview with Ronnie Robinson, I've been thinking a lot about Overeaters Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 Step Program in general. And I'm struck by how helpful both Ronnie and I found going to Overeaters Anonymous meetings, but that neither of us worked the 12 steps or we both tried, but the 12 steps didn't resonate. And I look at the 12 steps and I just think they were written for alcohol. Originally they were written a long time ago within a very religious context and they've now shaped and morphed into something more modern and more of a spiritual approach. But for some people I think the language um, doesn't resonate. But also I think that it's harder to apply to food because mm, we still got to eat, right? So it's very different to giving something up entirely and having that real clear line between whatever the behavior is that's a problem and not doing the behavior. So it got me thinking and it got me thinking about this idea of working steps. I quite like that as an idea for binge eating recovery. So I thought, what are the steps that I went through and what are the things that I continue to do today to take care of myself um, when it comes to binge eating recovery? So I've come up with seven steps and I've put them into an order that I think makes sense, but I would never be too strict about the order. Um, but the idea being that when you work through the steps at the end, you would commit to working the steps in your life. Because I think what people want to do is they want to come in to get some binge eating help, be told what they need to do, stop binge eating, and then life carries on as normal. But I think to recover from something like binge eating takes deep fundamental change. And because food is such a big part of our lives, we can't change this one area of our life and everything else staying the same. So it involves personal transformation. Um, it involves sometimes relationship transformation as well. Um, and this is why something like a STEP program, I think, is really helpful as a frame for living. So these steps, I think only two of them are even about eating at all. But um, these steps are a way of building a way of being that's just incompatible with binge eating. So rather than it being like, stop binge eating, it's like, this is what I'm doing instead. And like binge eating just doesn't factor into this. It doesn't make sense to binge when I'm living like this. So let's dive into the seven steps. And the first step, you might have seen it coming, Step number one is to let go of intentional weight loss. Now I know that this is a really big deal probably for most of you and it certainly was for me. I can remember in my bulimic days talking to a psychiatrist and she said to me, um, you need to let go. I don't think she used the word let go, she goes, you need to stop wanting to lose weight. And I remember thinking that that was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard. And I said to her, how do you stop the heart from wanting what it wants? <laughs> kind of makes me cringe a little bit. And I actually think that that's a line from a film or a TV show or something. I don't know where it came from. But that was what I said to her. And I remember she just looked at me and, and just kind of went. And part of me felt like, ah, touche, I got you. Like, you've got no comeback to that. If this is something you want, no one can tell you not to want something. So my question to you around this is this <laughs> has focusing intentionally focusing on losing weight helped with recovering from binge eating or has it made it worse if it helps crack on by all means take that route but if it doesn't help and i'm guessing that's probably the majority of people just based on my own experience and um and working with other people is that it doesn't, it makes it worse. So the only reason to let go of it is because there is no other way through. But also I think with this one, there can be an idea that once you've realized this, 
you should be able to just let it go. But this, this stuff's sticky and, and if this is something you've struggled with for a long time and also something that has a lot of emotional meaning and value and maybe there's pressure from other people around you or doctors or family or whoever, that this can be a really tricky thing to be like, well, I'm just supposed to never try and lose weight. So this is what I suggest, that you make it a daily decision. So it would be like, today I'm not focusing on weight loss because I know that it makes things worse when I do. And tomorrow I can make a different decision if I want to. Having that hatch open, that this is always a possibility, I, I think personally the paradox being it's then easier not to focus on it, knowing that in the future it's possible. It may, also makes me think of like um, a lot of people in alcohol recovery or some kind of addiction recovery who will just say like just for today I'm not picking up so that idea just for today I'm not going to focus on on intentionally trying to lose weight so if throughout the day you're feeling a bit panicky or anxious about how much to eat or that you think you might have eaten too much you bring yourself back to this like I thought about this this morning and I made a decision that for today I'm not focusing on it and tomorrow morning I will sit with this and ask myself the question again about what I want to do today. Because even now, you know, for me, thoughts of weight loss will come into my mind from time to time. It does happen. I'm not, I'm human and I live in a culture that's telling me that I should be wanting to lose weight, right? This is why I feel like it's a step that needs to be worked as opposed to something you just do once. So step number two is to make time for stillness and self-reflection. Now we live in a world that is full of ways that we can distract ourselves, yet we're still not satisfied. We're human. It's quite hard to find satisfaction as a human when we're chasing it in the wrong places. So, so many people, they have busy lives and maybe you've got a lot of people to look after in a stressful job or and the idea of making time for stillness and self-reflection is just not appealing. And in terms of how you can do this, there are many ways. You might think about meditation, sort of journaling, going for a walk, even standing by the window and drinking a cup of tea or coffee whilst gazing at the outside world. But it's about having that intention to watch your own thoughts, watch your own mind, because Without getting to know ourselves better, we keep being run by these parts of us that we're not conscious of, and so we don't understand our behavior, we don't understand why we keep going there. Obviously, therapy is a great one for self-reflection, but that's not just not accessible for everybody. So there's plenty of other ways to do it. And also, once we get start developing the capacity to be with ourselves, that desire to escape ourselves can diminish. Right, like that moment that suddenly there's nothing stimulating us, there's nothing to get our attention. So quite often we pick up our phones, we check our phones. What's it like to just sit with that discomfort, to start sitting with yourself? That's the only way we can get to know ourselves. And for some of you, this might be incredibly difficult because you may have a mind that just races and races. So it's like helping what helps you to slow down. For some people, walking meditations are a great idea. If you've got a really active mind, sitting still in meditation just may be really challenging for you. But going for a walk, just noticing things around you and not having your headphones in. And of course your mind's going to wander and each time you realise your mind is wandering, you bring it back. This also develops that skill of um, increasing our attention spans and having some control over where we put our attention. That is one of the most valuable life skills that we can develop. Because so often our attention is just being dragged this way by our thoughts and our feelings and we're sort of running on these programs and these autopilots. And you know, we know, they think that our attention spans are getting even worse, right? You flick it, we're scrolling all the time, we're clicking on this, the app, we've got instant gratification, now when people, or newspapers, they put up an article on social media, they put three minute or four minute read because, you know, God forbid, it takes eight minutes to read an article. So without creating stillness, we can't get in touch with our inner knowing. We can't get in touch with um, a 
deeper part of us. I want to say our truth, and I know that sounds really sort of Instagrammy, maybe sounds a bit naff, but I think we all have this inner knowing and a seat of intuition, and it's just being covered up by noise and emotions and so many other things. So that getting still with ourselves enables us to tune into ourselves, and it's that part of us that isn't compulsive. You know, that part of us, that inner knowing that knows what's best for us at a higher level. And that's the part that we want to get in touch with. And we can only do that by making time to spend with ourselves in some form of stillness or reflection. And step number three is to separate yourself from your binge urges. That urge to binge is not you. It's an experience that you have. And one thing that's unique to human beings is that we have this capacity to watch ourselves and to notice ourselves. And in that moment of compulsion when we start binging, it's like part of us just goes offline and we can't understand afterwards where we went because it feels like we were unconscious that time. So one really helpful way of separating yourself from your binge urges is to give it a name. Um, and to really get to know like what happens for you before a binge. So for some people it's these really clear thoughts of wanting to binge, of arguing with oneself. And for other people it's just like a really strong feeling and their thinking seems to go offline. Like whatever it is, understanding what that is for you and finding a name for it. Because when you find a name for it, you can say, when the experience starts to happen, the thoughts or the feelings come up, you can say, I recognize I am experiencing a binge urge, whatever name you give to it. And I've heard some amazing names from, you know, characters and stories and all sorts of things, something that kind of embodies it so that when the experience is happening, you can name it. And the moment you name it, you become the namer, not the experience. So if you say, I notice I am experiencing a binge urge, there's two eyes in that sentence, there's the I who's noticing and the I who's experiencing the binge urge. So the more we become the noticer and we're able to watch ourselves, and this is why the stillness and self-reflection is so important, the calmer we can stay and it's easier to stay present because we're engaging that part of ourselves um, who is capable of perhaps stepping in and making a, a different choice. Another important reason for separating yourself from the binging is because like, we've got to get past this idea that you're somehow defective in some way, that the reason you're struggling with this is because you're not trying hard enough. We have to get past that because that is part of the eating disorder itself. So when we kind of can put it into the, all the binge eating stuff, we can sort of bring together then we've got the rest of us. This idea that the binge eating disorder is a part of you and then there's the rest of you. But when the binge eating is really loud and takes over, it feels like it's all of you. And without being able to make that distinction, it's really hard to feel that any other uh, course of action is possible apart from continuing to binge. And I'm conscious that I've taken more time than I thought I was going to over these steps. So I think it might make sense to make this into two videos. So I'm going to call this the end of part one here and um, I will upload part two very shortly. See you in part two.